Terry, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming to my neighborhood. Thanks for inviting me. Mm-hmm. Well, when you wanted to do it in person in Milwaukee and you didn't necessarily have a spot in mind, I'm like, I know just the spot. So Perfect. We're at Vanguard today. Vanguard in Milwaukee's Bayview neighborhood, and I will reveal my biases up front. It is my favorite bar in the world. Awesome. It's, uh, first of all, it's not too far from where I live. I live in this neighborhood as well. But as I was telling you inside, it's a house-made sausage joint. They've got a great whiskey selection, good craft beer selection. They serve food late night. So if you go to a concert, a brewer's game, whatever it is, you can come here for your late night fix. Fries, cheese curds, various stylized sausages are like... The, that hits the spot at sure. midnight or so. But uh, That sounds you know, like Milwaukee. It is. Yeah. It is. Though I'd say the unique thing that's maybe a little twist on Milwaukee is the two co-owners are big wrestling fans. So it is not a wrestling bar. But what I love about it and I, what I love about the vibe is they, they just have two TVs inside. And those TVs, if it's a consequential Wisconsin sporting event, they'll be showing what it is. So Bucks games, Packers games, things like that. But otherwise, it's doing like reruns on silent of old 80s wrestling, 80s game show. Um, so the uh, the co-owners are big wrestling fans, but it is not a wrestling bar per se. But it's a nice little nod to their hobby. No, this is awesome. This is gorgeous. And I should say, we're on the patio today, which is also a nice little beer garden tucked away. Nice wooden walls, so a uh, serene spot. So thank you for, for coming here for this interview. But that is all I'm going to talk about things that aren't related to you today because this is your interview terry no so. it's odd we're here to talk what, about what you want to talk about well I, what i want to talk about is your new book inspiring champions in advanced manufacturing so okay. let's uh this isn't theoretical because we're hanging out at the bar today if you're hanging out having a beer with someone how do you describe your new book well my new book is is intended to inspire young people that know nothing about manufacturing and to be honest, that's the easy job. Mm -hmm. The hard job is inspiring and convincing those into young people's parents. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of the parents in our country, you know, the, their yesteryear's manufacturing is not what manufacturing is today. Mm -hmm. And they want the best for their child, and, and I understand that, and they should. But knowing reality and, and what's possible in today's manufacturing space, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So what I tried to do is, is I tried to make a book that appeals to the parents that has the parent edition. Yep. And then also has the student edi edition on the other side. Yeah. So it's meant for one to read and then flip it over to the other. Yeah. And yeah. so they both read from the outside in and then have questions for the one for the other. Mm -hmm. And then there's also QR codes to go to a digital element about the subject matter. There's right. about 20 or 30 uh, QR codes. Yeah, and there, the books are a series of interviews, and there's uh, there's some overlap. There's a lot of overlap between the two different editions, but some interviews are geared towards the student edition, mm -hmm. um, while others are geared towards the parent edition. If correct. Will. Is that correct? Yeah. That is correct. But there is a lot of overlap. So that there's commonality on certain stories. And then in the back of each uh, book, I actually have a list of what's common to both and mm -hmm. what's unique to both. So if they want to focus on what's common, they can look at the list and say, oh, you had this story. Let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Or if they want to say, all right, tell me about this story that was in your side of the book that I didn't read. Well, I, if I understand correctly, a way to summarize your mission is you're trying to change parental perceptions around manufacturing. Is that a fair comment? That's a very fair comment, but I'll, I'll expand it in to say that I'm trying to change perception about manufacturing in our culture overall. Mm -hmm. In other words... I think manufacturers have done a poor job at really bragging about their industry in this yeah. country. And I also think that, you know, from an education standpoint, you know, guidance counselors need to know more about what's possible in manufacturing careers. Mm -hmm. The educational sector, um, you know, those in, in government leadership need to know more about it. Yeah. And yes, the parents themselves also, as well as the young people. And we're going to talk about all that here in a little bit, but I want to get to know a bit about your background first, because you have 
a diverse, non-traditional background, I would say, because, you know, you and I, I, I graduated from Marquette. I think the way you phrase it is you went to Marquette to study enough mechanical engineering to get what you needed, and then you moved into other things. But yeah. th give, me, give me a bit about your background, because I think you come from a family tooling business as well, too. Is that correct? I do. I do. In uh, about a year and a half, our family will celebrate 100 years of manufacturing. Hey, congrats. Cheers to that. Yeah, yeah cheers to gotta, that. We right. got to do that. That's <laughs> Mm. But um, but to you know to expound on you know my background, growing up, uh, I I was a good student. Well, I shouldn't say that. I had the ca capacity to be a good student. Okay. I was an AP calculus, AP physics student, and I I just got bored. Yeah. The relevance and the way that I was taught didn't match, mm -hmm. and I couldn't really things weren't clicking. So I had to study longer than I should have, even though I didn't want to. And so I did okay, um, but as I went into college, I went to a very good prep school in, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So the education was awesome. Mm -hmm. So I went into college, and I went to f <laughs> five different colleges. Okay. And uh, initially it was Florida State. They didn't have engineering at the time. Yeah. Transferred to UW-Madison, which is a great engineering school. Yeah. And uh, it's also very cold in the middle of the winter mm -hmm. uh, between the two lakes, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, I transferred back to our, where my girlfriend was down in Florida, and eventually we got soon thereafter married and moved up to Wisconsin and settled in Wisconsin, uh, took a job with my uh, my uncle, who had a extremely large machine shop mm -hmm. at the time, probably maybe 200, 250 people. It grew to 750 people. And for about less than a year, I worked for him buying material. Mm -hmm. um, did a lot with central steel and different you know, steel manufacturing, Bethlehem steel. And I uh, went to night school at Marquette. Mm -hmm. And so I worked during the day and then went to uh, mechanical engineering school at night. Well, what I realized is, first of all, you know, I was downtown till 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, three nights a week. And then I got into thermal dynamics, my third year, six year in college, third year in night school. And I'm like, what am I doing? My wife is, is raising the kids by herself. I'm rarely ever home. I'm downtown till one in the morning. You know, when I get home, everyone's fast asleep. And uh, do I really need all this engineering? So the intent wasn't to stay in school long enough to get what I needed. Yeah. I genuinely wanted to finish. Yeah. But I, I quickly realized in the in the selling machine tool sector that I was in, which is the same job I've been in for 43 years now, that once I got to thermal dynamics, I said, OK, I'm good. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as long as my wife would agree with me, I would uh, I would then, you know, stop going to school. For all practical purposes, I haven't used much of my thermodynamics background since graduating, but it is m one of my most common examples when I say, if I can solve a thermo 2 problem, I can certainly solve this problem I'm facing in my career right well now. Well said. Very yeah. well said. So when, at what point, let's say, did your mission evolve beyond, you know, selling machine tools, being in that industry, to I'm going to get more people? in this industry? Well, it probably started, you know, officially started in the mid nineties. Uh, Harry Mosier was a friend of mine. He came from the Charmy EDM. He was chairman of the Charmy EDM company. Mm -hmm. And he was making a push to get young people into manufacturing. Yeah. And so he said, Terry, you know, you really should go and speak to young, you know, high school students. So I, so I did. And I realized pretty quickly that talking to one group of students was was great, and, mm -hmm. and I was glad to help young people learn. But what I realized that that wasn't adequate. Yeah. I just didn't feel like I was making a big enough impact. Yeah. So uh, Harry pivoted and, and ended up uh, founding the uh, Reshoring Initiative, mm -hmm. which is basically convincing companies to come back to the U.S. that offshored to uh, China or Asia. And uh, I said, Harry, that's a phenomenal initiative, but who's going to make all these Who's going to run the machines? Who's going to set up the machines? And who's going to make these parts when you bring everything back? And that's when I started thinking, all right, I need to, I need to start an initiative that convinces people that manufacturing is not dark, dirty, dangerous, and dead end mm -hmm. as, they, as they think it is. Yeah. So one question I have then is this isn't your first book that it's you not. wrote on manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, what did you cover 
in your first book, and then why, were, wh why did you feel you needed to write more after that? So when I first started to talk about writing the first book, mm -hmm. my wife had indicated, you know, you really should write separate books. And I'm like, honey, I'm not sure I can write one book, much less separate <laughs> and books. And that book is called Finding America's Next Great Champion, correct? It's called Finding America's Greatest Champion. Greatest Champion, Next Great Champion. I was so close. No, that's so good. close. That's good. I'll it's blame good. the beer. No, it's all this good. This is a non-alcoholic beer, too, so I yeah, don't even have I that was, as an excuse. I was actually proud of that. <laughs> um, so when I started Writing it, um, it, it addresses students, parents, educators, and industry. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it kind of covers the whole gambit. But then I realized, you know, we need a book that speaks just to two audiences. And then I came up with the concept of two front covers. Yeah. And the parent and student component is, if we can figure that out in terms of communication in realizing what reality is versus perception, mm -hmm. then we can we can literally solve the skills gap that we have. Yeah. So I decided to focus the second book more on students and parents specifically. Okay, I appreciate that. And what we're I'm going to give people kind of a teaser to the book, but also try to understand why you included some of these things in the book. So one of the first areas, which was a bit of this was informational for me. You talked about the apprenticeship program over in Germany. I believe it was specifically where you have portable ap apprenticeships and exams and their credentials mm -hmm. for the individuals that are teaching that. Mm -hmm. You know, do you see an opportunity for that to start to rise here in the US right now versus how it's been done over there where manufacturing uh, I think more people are becoming familiar with this is uh, has traditionally been considered a more prestigious career mm -hmm. over there versus here. Totally true. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to respond to that, I mean, in Germany, one of the comments that's in the book that, that I, I, I got from Virginia Rounds, who's in the second book, from the German-American Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and she, um, she quotes uh, her boss, actually. She says that Germany has the system, but they don't have the people. Mm-hmm. The United States has the people, but they don't have the system. Mm -hmm. So we have 330-some-odd million people, but our culture is uniquely different than yeah. Europe. Germany and Europe has the culture, as you said, mm -hmm. but they have, I think, 30 million people. Yeah. And their uh, population is on the decline. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is, is the apprenticeship model alive and well in the U.S.? It is. It's, it's on a comeback. It was alive and well in the 70s and 80s. But during the recession of 83, 82, and that mm -hmm. time frame, which I mm -hmm. lived up in Milwaukee at that time, yeah, a lot of people started closing their apprenticeship programs. Mm -hmm. And so what has has happened is someone made the the really difficult uh, or hurtful comment that we were going to be a service-based economy. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to be in manufacturing to know that that's, that's not a good thing for a country mm -hmm. that has economic... Um, superiority and pros you know is very prosperous as a, as a nation mm -hmm. because manufacturing has to be at the core. So they started closing a lot of the apprenticeship uh, systems and a lot of apprenticeship uh, uh, they started closing a lot of the apprenticeship programs let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So that being said now the German American Chamber of Commerce in which is very alive and well in, in the Milwaukee area in the Midwest they have started to come back with a lot of apprenticeship programs. Mm -hmm. But the culture is still not different than it used to be. It's starting to get better, but the culture in Europe is significantly more uh, in line and in accordance with apprenticeship mentality. Yeah, and, and I what stuck out to me when I was reading the book was just how it makes the roles much more transferable. Like when you have those specific credentials mm -hmm. as a tradesperson, you know when you're hiring someone what you're going to get going from company A to company B versus here where it's a little more, yeah, I've got that experience, but it's a little vague. Yep. I, I have another question that maybe maybe this leads us to how are we going to continue to make this change? One of the quotes that stuck out the most in the book was, I think I paraphrased a little bit, but I believe you said real success um, doesn't require money. It requires engagement, the success factor, if you will. Mm -hmm. Engagement with your child to help them pick the best path. Does that ring a bell? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I, I try to talk about is 
you know, I, I was in a meeting this morning that I spoke of this, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I said is that in our country, a lot of us are fortunate fortunate enough to save money to send our child to, to school, but a lot mm -hmm. of us uh, of others are not able to. Yeah. So there, either way, there's no right or wrong way, but it's reality. Mm -hmm. And just because we save enough money for our ch child to go to college, just telling them, go figure it out and go to school, well, that's not necessarily how it should work. Yeah. And so in Europe, what they do is they work really, really hard, and it's part of their culture, to understand each individual mm -hmm. and what really makes them tick and what they're passionate about and what they, their aptitude says about them mm -hmm. that they'll succeed in. So they go into an apprenticeship program when they're probably 16 years old, maybe even younger, and they come out ready to rock and roll at 18, 19, 20 years old. In our country, first of all, that's one of the challenges that the apprenticeship model has is the education and getting that information and that mentality down to a 15, 16 year old young, young person, male or mm -hmm. female. Mm -hmm. That being said, the fact of the matter is that a lot of us, a lot of us parents, we send our child off to school and we said, we say, figure it out. Well, they have a delay of success, whatever that may be anywhere from two years to five years. And if they don't get a degree, maybe as long as seven years, mm -hmm that they could have been already know what they want to do, get trained for it, and then be in a, a good paying role making a career out of it. Yeah. So now on the other side of the coin, one of the things that I, I'm pretty vocal about is young people going into debt for education is, is extremely difficult and extremely uh, difficult to succeed early in the game. And so there's a lot of, people in manufacturing that will allow you to learn and earn mm -hmm. or earn and learn where they'll pay for your education in the technical sector to be part of, you know, their company or their, or their industry. Yeah. So, but a lot of people, they don't know this. And, and so if we could just get the word out and, you know, I tell young people all the time, Chris, that look, if you look at manufacturing and it's not for you, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm hmm it's, it's only wrong if our industry or our leaders in our sector don't at least put it on the table for you to know about and decide one way or another. And, you know, once doing that, there's going to be a factor of two, three, four, ten times more people in our industry. Yeah. Even if 50 percent, 40 percent, even 70 percent decide it's not for them, we're still incrementally making huge gains. Well, maybe I have some tangible examples then that showcase how we're getting people more aware of manufacturing. Because some of the ones that stuck out that you talked about in your book were children's maker spaces. I'd never heard about this before, but I looked it up on YouTube and there's there's almost, I'd say, a formula or like best practices for creating a maker space for a child so that they can exercise, let's say, manufacturing creativity while they're young. I'm just giving my perception on it. I'd love to hear what you know about these maker spaces. Well, I don't claim to be a, a total expert on maker spaces, but the, the maker space movement in mm -hmm. general talks a lot about exposing young people in an environment where they're comfortable, that they're almost learning about manufacturing or learning about building almost by accident. And so I think there's still a need for young people to be presented with. Um, I was a part of an organization down in, in Florida called Flate, and they were doing coloring books about manufacturing settings. Mm -hmm. And that's a good example of what, what's needed so that when they talk about manufacturing or they hear something about manufacturing, that they're actually genuinely curious because they were presented with something, you know, when they're a young at a young age. Yeah. But they have Lego robotic teams that, you know, that are outside of the maker space. But putting a young person in an environment where they can build things and understand the concept of building. I mean, how many times have you heard a parent say, you know, my my son or my daughter went into engineering and, you know, I'd give them a toy and they'd have it all apart. Yeah. And then yeah, they yeah, yeah. try to put it back <laughs> together. That's an engineer or a manufacturer or a maker uh, in the making, so to speak. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot 
uh, to know about Makerspaces. Uh, there's a Makerspace movie. There's Makerspace programs in mm -hmm. communities. Uh, and then there's Lego Robotics. There's robotic teams mm -hmm. in different high schools. Uh, what we what I'm trying to do is is try to get down into the middle schools and expose them to manufacturing through uh, camps and you know making a pen and pencil set or a pen set with a case and uh, we just did our first camp where we laser engraved their name on a uh, on a plaque yeah. and when they leave they've got that pen in that case with their name on it well I think people are getting more familiar with those robotic programs but I've also heard you talk about like I think Wheeling High School, something like that. They've actually made manufactured parts for, like, NASA before. Mm -hmm. How does something like that play out? Because we're familiar with some of those school programs, if you will, but how does something like that work? Well, it doesn't happen without an industry member reaching out and making a connection to that school. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was a, uh, there was a manufacturer that was a dear friend of mine who passed away. Uh, the name of the company was Numerical Precision. Mm-hmm. And they, in fact, uh, Egon Yegan was someone that the Chicago audience will know very, very well and remember him very fondly. Mm -hmm. He was from Switzerland. Okay. And so he was a big advocate for manufacturing and for apprenticeship programs. And so he was very involved, and he uh, had different – one part that he made uh, was a wrench that when the, sp when the shuttle went up and launched the um, – the Hubble telescope, mm -hmm. the wrench that they built actually was used to repair the Hubble telescope in space. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other, Wheeling is a very manufacturing centric community. Elk Grove is a very, in Illinois, is a very manufacturing centric community. So, when different companies reach out to Wheeling High School or other high schools, Elk Grove High School, they make connections and they actually want the high school program to make components for something that, that they are uh, involved in, i.e. Mm -hmm. the space program. It's another, one other example I want to talk about, then I've got some general questions outside the book. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel we're getting better at celebrating manufacturing? Like you talk about National Signing Day, where, mm -hmm. I, if I'm familiar with it, high school students sign to the companies they're going to go work for. Mm -hmm. Is that how that works? Yeah, there's actually two different type of national signing days. One is when a young person goes into the industry, mm -hmm. and another is when the young person goes into like a technical college, you know, more conventional like you would when you're going to a to a school university or so. Mm -hmm. So there's two different ones, and I, I didn't realize that they were both going on at simultaneously out there. But uh, one of them started out in Virginia. Uh, I think it was Hen Henrico Co College or Henrico community college mm -hmm. and I ended up talking to the gentleman that actually instituted and came up with this concept but yeah our culture has a long way to go so to answer your question are we getting better we are did we start at a very low point mm -hmm. we did okay is yeah. there a lot further to go yes and the reason I say that is you have high schools bringing back programs which is awesome we have industry um, still has a long way to go. Reaching out to educators to make connections and have partnerships, yes. Are there enough people doing that? No, not, not at all. Uh, and then the, the big caveat is are enough parents convinced that manufacturing is an option for, their, uh, for a career path for their child? And the answer to that is no. So then you just wrote the book on it. What, what are maybe one, two, or three things that need to happen for parents to be more aware and start presenting this differently? Oh, boy. Um, good question. Well, first of all, there's something called Manufacturing Day. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Bout from Edge Factor, myself, uh, Rodney Grover on our board for Champion Now, and I were at a meeting at, at my office in 2012. Mm -hmm. And we had FM, FMA there, TMA there. Uh, these are all acronyms for associations, which mm -hmm. you probably know and I know, but some of your listeners may not. And we were trying to advocate a national manufacturing awareness type day where manufacturers could actually brag about what they do. Mm -hmm. And FMA, Pat Lee from FMA, said, held her hand up and said, well, hold on, hold on. 
our board is going to vote on something called Manufacturing Day within the next week or month ahead. And so we said, great. Well, that was the birth of Manufacturing Day. That, that initiative prior to that meeting that we talked about and we you know, gave feedback to encourage, now we have Manufacturing Day every single year. Yeah. So manufacturers have to sign up for Manufacturing Day uh, they have to uh, invite their communities, parents and students alike, and show off and be proud of what manufacturing is. That's probably number one. Number two, and this is going to be hard to say without coming off the wrong way, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I say it wrong. Parents need to be more informed and more focused on what Every given child shines or is passionate about or has the natural God-given ability to do. Mm -hmm. Well, that may mean that when you're sitting in a group with other parents and you're trying to brag about your son or daughter going to Carroll College or going to, um, trying to think, Marquette University or MSOE or uh, Northwestern, okay, Mm -hmm. that maybe that's not the right fit for them. The reality is, if you take the number of young people go to college, the number of young people that get a degree in either four or five years, and then the number of young people that actually use that degree in their profession, Mm -hmm. you're talking less than 20% of the market. Yeah. So this message, you know, has to reach, you know, parents so that they understand that they should be proud of whatever their child does, uh, that yes, it it is nice. And even if they've saved the money, which they've worked their entire careers to save, that money can be used for a down payment for a home. That money can be used for seed money for their own company, start their own company. Uh, So that money can be used for a lot of good things for the betterment of their child and uh, a lesser costly education too. But the match with our young people with what they're inherently gifted at and what they're passionate and and really interested in, that has to be by design, not by accident. And you're going to accelerate your child's success. And it may be a four-year degree. I'm not against a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. I think that 15 or 20 percent, that's perfect for them. Yeah. I'm concerned about the 75 to 85 percent. That's what I'm I'm concerned about. And And then lastly... We need to get industry and education on the same page. Just like I'm trying to do with with the Inspiring Champions and Advanced Manufacturing book, I'm trying to connect parents and and the parent and the child. Have conversation, honestly, more like what they do in Europe when they're 14, 15 years old about here's all the different things you could do, here's what you're good at, here's what you enjoy. Uh, Get involved in internships early on. Mm-hmm. Find out if you go to a manufacturing company and you're like, I do not want to do that. That's not a bad thing. You looked at it. You thought it was for you and you were glad to know about it. But you decided, no, nothing bad about that. Yeah. And and so point being, let's get the process going so much quicker. Mm-hmm. There's a significant number of young people that either drop out of college. I did. I decided, okay, I'm I'm done. I've had enough, right? And then they kind of stumble around until they find their way into a career. Well, I was fortunate. I had two uncles and my father and my grandfather that were in manufacturing. So I was good in math and science. So, you know, that was, you know, easy for me. Well, that's not the same for everybody else. So those are at least three concepts that I think would go a long way to help our culture change. Yeah. So if I heard you correctly, number one, show up and be proud of what manufacturing is. Mm -hmm. Two, it goes back to your comment earlier where it's like the real success factor. It's not money. It's engagement with figuring out what the best path is for your kid. Mm -hmm. And then and and looking at what are their talents and making sure manufacturing is is part of that. And then Mm -hmm. third thing I heard was, hey, you got to get industry parents, students, these champions all on the same page as well. We need them to, to engage so that when, when there's engagement, 
when there's engagement with your child mm-hmm. or when there's engagement between partners, yeah. say a, an industry member and an educator, mm-hmm. man, really cool things happen when that's the case. So that, I, that was, I think, the big call to action in this. We'll get more as we start to wrap up the interview, but we're in the, the twilight of our interview and probably the twilight of our beverages as well. So uh, more of a fun question. You know, What new jobs are you most excited about right now in the manufacturing space? Oh, wow. Well, the one thing I don't know anything about is how, how is AI going to Im- impact manufacturing? Sure. We've uh, been talking about that on the podcast a little bit, and it's very it's more how do we think or where is it making an early impact has been the discussion, but we don't know necessarily the long-term outcome yet. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think the automation game is, is a necessity, and I think any type of automation where – the task or the job, the role of the the person in that career, that it's a challenging career and you're not just loading a machine or feeding, you know, a mechanism. Um, so the automation component for sure is, is the future and is exciting. Uh, when I got involved initially in manufacturing, computerization was just at, at the beginning stages. And so computerization is, is rapidly, um, come to the forefront of manufacturing. So young people, you know, I talk in, in the book a lot about there's a lot of gamers and, you know, I don't think I realize how big gaming is worldwide. And a lot of gamers are inherently perfect matches for computerized machine processes. And so I, a lot of people don't know that as well. So as far as uh, other things that I'm most excited about, I mean, 3D printing, I, I didn't think 3D printing would be where it's at today when it first came out. I thought, you know, you know, subtractive ma- manufacturing is actually what machining used to be. Yeah. We didn't call it subtractive, mm-hmm. but then additive came along. So I think that um, 3D printing, it's interesting how far it's come, how, f- how much further it'll go, I don't know. But when you see a mechanism that's totally assembled and you have a working mem- uh, uh, assembly with gears that mesh and, and actually operate. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I have a I have a question about the book writing process itself because one of the things that I enjoyed as I was listening to the audiobook version was some manufacturing happy hour alumni were in there. Uh, Drew Crow from episode forty six and more recently one twenty four. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nicole Walter from episode one twenty eight um, were some of the featured stories in there. Sure. But I'm curious, how do you go about picking? the stories that you feature in a book that really mm. compiles a lot of examples to showcase, hey, here are some reasons why we need to bring more awareness to manufacturing, and here are some people that are also doing it in their own unique ways. Well, I think, I think you know, reinventing the wheel has always been a bad idea, right? So, you know, I, I, in my job, I get to meet a lot of people, and I'm, I try to be socially aware uh, in a lot of ways, both in social media and in, in social issues. When I wrote the first book, the Me Too movement was, was going uh, through its process. And so I really focused a lot on, you know what, why aren't there more women in our industry? Mm-hmm. I don't understand that. Yeah. And, and there's, no, there, there's no good reason. There's no valid reason for that. Mm-hmm. And so I put some of that focus. Um, when I started, started writing the first book, Chris, I realized that I knew a lot of really interesting people and that if they were willing to talk and, and, and engage in an interview that I could include their thoughts, uh, that I was interested in that. Mm-hmm. When I went to the second book, I realized that at that point, being relevant is very important to me uh, and being current because that's what people want to hear, right? And I'm sure as a podcaster, that's important to you. Well, during the writing of the second book, uh, the racial awakening was going through. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and I reflected on my first book, and I'm like, man, I did a terrible job about not being an advocate or a voice for people of color in our industry. Mm-hmm. There's there's not enough female uh, uh, workers and, and employees in our industry, but there's even less people of color. Yeah. So I thought, all right, I, I have to make this right. It's been I, like a little self-reflection exercise each time you go through it. A little for bit. sure. Yeah. For sure. And so... Uh, when I noticed, you know, throughout the industry and throughout the, you know, the different platforms, you know, I think when I first learned of Drew, 
Um, I didn't know Drew. And, and, and probably the people that I had to reach out to introduce myself to was probably less – out of 100 interviews was probably less than 25%. So a lot of people I already knew. But Drew, I didn't. And I noticed that, you know, he was talking about a young person. It was one of the first videos I ever saw where he's talking about the student at the community college – all of a sudden was real inspired and energetic and then just kind of faded, you know, faded to black, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, and just kind of disappeared. Yeah. And when he approached him, he said, well, my mom says I really shouldn't be pushing buttons all day long. And, and he and I'll never forget this video. He says, dude, what are you talking about? And he picked up, the, you know, a phone. He yeah. says, you push buttons all day long, you know, yeah. and wh yeah. why not get paid good money for it? Yeah. And I thought, all right, this guy has something to say yeah and we need i need to try to elevate his voice yeah well in the time that it took me to write the book which was probably a year or more drew went from you know just barely being on social media mm -hmm. to all of a sudden becoming you know the mega mega star that he is yeah in uh, manufacturing promotion yeah, and for those out there, episode 46, 124. If you haven't listened to those and want to hear more about Drew's story, that's where you can find him. Uh, you know, I, I only have one more big question for you, and that is, we've talked about this a little bit, but why write this book now? Why was it critical to write Inspiring Champions in Advanced Manufacturing at this moment in time? Okay, well, first of all, my journey in manufacturing started 43 years ago. Mm-hmm. Secondly, I started being an advocate to young people in about 95. Mm -hmm. I started the organization in 2012. And, and, I, and I then started writing the first book in probably 2013, but didn't really publish it to 2018. Okay. So I got to the point where I'm like, all right, the first book's great. Everyone that reads it thinks it's really cool and has a lot to offer. But it's not concise and succinct enough for the audience that it's going to matter the most. Mm hmm and so all of a sudden, COVID happens. I wrote mm -hmm. a lot of this during COVID. And now there's an epiphany while I'm writing it that the American public is realizing, man, we should be making more in this country. Yeah. Why, yeah. why, why, why do we want all our goods sitting off Long Beach or, or California on any one of 200 different ships yeah. waiting to get on the dock? Not to mention it's sitting in port not being able to be unloaded for months. Mm -hmm. And so some of this timing I kind of fell into, but I'll go back and say that it started either in 1980 or in the 90s, and it's been a progression that's been a natural progression. I always felt that as, as at any given point in my, in my career, it was bad that it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that I can actually say that we have, there's hope of it getting better because yeah. awareness, awareness is, is key and it's starting to, people are spar starting to have an epiphany about awareness. Mm -hmm. What's lacking, there has not really been the call to action that there needs to be. Yeah. I mean, you had some stats that kind of answered the question maybe a little bit for me while I was reading the book, like 69% of manufacturers want to be moving production back to the U.S. Um, and, and it's almost, there's an element of us doubling down on our strengths also because i think and and i've seen different versions of this stat but u.s manufacturing alone represents what like the eighth largest economy in the world it is um and t we make 20 percent of the world's good so it's not like we're not doing it anymore but you know we certainly started moving away from it so we i'm did. excited to see how it starts moving back. I, uh, this has been a great conversation. Terry, is there anything you wish I would have asked you that hasn't come up in this discussion yet? Wow, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I, you know, I just think that, you know, maybe people reaching out to try to get active to, uh, we're starting to do camps. Mm -hmm. if, if a manufacturer is listening to this and, and they want to, you know, sponsor a camp and mm -hmm. get involved, uh, that would be helpful. Um, you know, sometimes you know, I have a Kickstarter campaign about to start on August 23rd. All right. Um, people buy a, a box of books for Manufacturing Day and, and have a ready-made, uh, you know, passion project to carry their message forward. Yeah. So, you know, I think the main thing is, is I think a call to action is needed. And the more people, the merrier. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, and, and you, championnow.org is your website, I believe. It You've is. Also, I'll make sure to have links to connect with you, like on LinkedIn, for anyone that's listening as well. Um, any other spots you want me to share, I'll make sure those are included in the show notes at manufacturinghappyhour.com. But in the meantime, I feel like our beers are getting light. It's probably time. Since we're at Vanguard, you know, a curry worst is probably the next order of business. But uh, okay. I do have to say thank you for taking the time to jump on today's show, Terry. Chris, I can't thank you enough, and it's been awesome, and uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, inviting me. Well, cheers. Cheers. Skull. Skull. <laughs>